So I told uh, Sally, I didn't promise her, but I told her I would try to remain around here because this is picking up my voice. Um, but I'm a walker, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> It come, oh, well, yeah, but oh, this is recording. Oh, carry over here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was, I, I normally, when I do uh, presentations, I normally bring a bunch of tools to me, traditional tools, or I talk on uh, plant ID and uses, things like that. Um, but then uh, Ruth sent me this email, and it had your guys' uh, Seven principles, <laughs> and I uh, read those, and I was like, "Oh, these people—they don't—they don't. I mean, they're going to be interested in that stuff, but they need to hear about the history of this local area, um, because the history of this local area is what happens when you don't follow these seven principles. Um, so, uh, if you don't like what I, I'm going to present, then you can blame Lucy, you know." <laughs> <laughs> long way of saying that. Um, so, uh, like Ruth said, I'm an enrolled member of the Confederate Tribes, Kush Loan Kwan Shaishla Indians. Uh, my great grandmother was Loan Kwan Shaishla, um, and I get to be enrolled under her bloodline. If I was going to introduce myself in the language, I would say Shaishla and Kwa Kwa Kwichindich, which means that I'm a Shaishla, Loan Kwa, and, Sa uh, and Caucasian person. <laughs> Um, my other side of the family came into the area in the 1890s or 1880s and uh, uh, homesteaded up Indian Creek. If you're familiar with the Beers family up Indian Creek, I do come from that family. Um, so I kind of wanted to start this out with uh, sort of a guided meditation. Um, so you can close your eyes or not, I don't care. Um, but imagine you're laying at home. It's just beginning to get light. The light's coming through. You smell cedar and smoke, alder smoke. You see sunlight piercing through the smoke and it hits your face and wakes you in the morning. You rise, you coax, split cedar with your flint knife. You coax some flames out of your, your fire that's been burning all night long get some heat going from your fire. You uncover your basket, you take some ripening thimble berries out of that basket and eat them, mix them with some salmon eggs and eat them for breakfast. Mm. <laughs> you cover that back up and you head out down to the mud flats because the tide is low. And whenever the tide is low, the table is set. There's food always available. You go down, take your clam basket, go down your wooden shovel, uh, carve out Pacific you would take that down and you start digging for clams. You get a bunch of clams going and a bunch of you notice three mass ship off the shore. And you you're not um, unfamiliar with ships. You've seen ships before. The Chinese have been here before. Uh, other cultures have been here before. And we trade with those people. The Chinooks come down with fifty foot canoes. So you're used to seeing ships off the shore. Nothing like this, but you go up, get your people, and you get it in your canoe, and you start canoeing out in the bay to meet them, to trade them. You bring some meat, some elk meat, some good dried meat, and you circle their canoe, or you circle their ship, and you come up to the side, and you present what you brought, you present meat for trade, you put it to your mouth, showing that it's good meat to eat, and you hear a lot of bangs, loud bum bum, as we call it and you're being fired upon. And that was 1792. So, um, the Laurent Law in 1792 uh, went out and met Robert Gray. And their canoe was fired upon. And they didn't understand why this was a, a normal thing, right? You go out and trade with people. But propaganda <laughs> was why that happened. The people that were on that canoe, on that I always call it canoe, so I'm used to canoe culture. So uh, people that were on that <coughs> ship had been told that the people in this area were cannibals. Oh, the Lorenqua people who 
introduce people up to the LC, we're all cannibals. Um, my knowledge, we are. <laughs> no worries. Um, but so they were fired upon in that instance because the meat, right, they were trading meat and they feared that for their lives, so they started firing on the So that was 1792, that was the first encounter with any white man, and that happened on the Laurel Quad here, just south of us. In the 1830s, more traders came in, and by that time that propaganda had faded, and there was a really uh, a lot of trade going on with Sayus Law, especially the Umpqua, um, because that was such a great river up there, uh, with a couple of different tributaries. But in Sayus Law up here, we were kind of, um, it was a narrow valley, we're kind of uh, uh, later visited, but in 1836, people started coming in and trading. And the, the traders really respected the ways of the native people because they knew what plants to gather. They, they were able to get them otters, um, elks, and beaver pelts, which was really popular at the time, um, which we really didn't understand because otter pelts are way better. Um, so in 1840s, uh, at the Lower Umpqua, missionaries started visiting the uh, Lower Umpqua people, and they uh, put them in an area and started preaching to them. And in our uh, traditions, we have lots of stories. Winter time is a time to tell stories. And creation stories are very numerous. Every people has their own creation story. Um, I have my creation story. I'll see people have theirs. Long Qua, we're actually the same people, so we share one. Uh, Coos people, Hanus people have their own creation story. And the Millet people, which is two bands of the Coos people, they actually have two separate creation stories. So this is very normal to have creation stories, but it is abnormal um, for us to understand that one creation story has to be true for everybody. Um, so that was the difficulty with the missionaries and the Lower Umpqua people. Um, they tried to get them to understand that, no, you have to believe this, <laughs> and uh, it didn't work. And one of the, this is a quote from uh, Reverend Gustavus, and after this quote, um, people escaped the mission for obvious reasons, but this quote says, doom of extinction was extended over this wretched race, and that's, that was the end of his sermon. <laughs> uh, in 1848, the Organic Act was passed, and for people that don't know, the Organic Act is um, the act that created the Oregon territories, okay, so Oregon, Idaho, uh, Washington at the time, and it, it did something other than just create the territories, it also brought um, the utmost good faith clause forward to the Oregon territories. And the utmost good faith clause states that um, basically that, that the tribes in the area have ownership over their lands. It gives them the rights over their lands. And after you put that law into place, uh, unless uh, a just and fair war is but upon them, which I don't know what a just and fair war is, but um, <laughs> but so they had rights over the lands. We have rights over our lands here. In order to purchase those lands back, once that is initiated, once the uh, utmost good faith clause is initiated, you have to have a treaty that is signed by both parties, uh, United States government and the tribe in the area, and then ratified. Um, and so in 1855, we did have a treaty that was signed, uh, the Great Coast Treaty, and it was signed by many leaders of nations from uh, up, upper uh, Oregon border, they're down to California, and into California, actually. And so that was signed, and it was sent back to uh, Congress, but um, <laughs> maybe uh, today's Congress has something to do with past Congresses, because it was never ratified. No action was taken. Um, a little political there, but. Uh, so no action was taken, and the people were moved anyway. The people were moved. They treated it like the treaty was signed, they, or was ratified, it was signed. Um, and they moved the people. They first moved the people um, to uh, the north spit of the Umpqua River, the people being the Coos people, 
and the Umpqua people. They moved them to the North Spit uh, of the Umpqua River, where they built uh, Fort Umpqua in 1856. And that's actually where my great 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 grandfather was born inside Fort Umpqua. But so Fort Umpqua was built in 1856, and that's where they moved the people around there as a military fort. Um, they, during that time, the 1850s, bounty hunters, regiments of soldiers, people would go out and gather up native people that had hidden out. Um, Baldiaca, Gregory Point, um, if you guys are familiar with Gregory Point, where the lighthouse is in Coos Bay, there's an island out there, and uh, used to be called Squaw Island. <laughs> and that's where a lot of people would hide uh, because there were caves in it down in there and the waves would hide the baby's cries from the soldiers and the bounty hunters and stuff. But, so in 1856, Fort Umpqua was built, and that was in use until 1859. And then in 1859, the people were moved, the uh, Umpqua and Coos people were moved from the North Spit, uh, still no ratified treaty, but were moved from the North Spit of the Umpqua up to Yahas. So we're moved up through this area, um, and the first time we were moved by a ship, uh, and we were moved by ship up to Yahas, which was the Al Sea sub agency, and Fort Umpqua agency closed down. Um, Fort Umpqua itself was open for a few more years until uh, 1862, but the military portion of it, as far as the um, supervision of Indians, closed. And people were moved up to the Yahas. Flats, as it was called, in the Alsi sub agency. Now, that was part of the Great Coast Reservation. The Great Coast Reservation ran from 10 miles north of the Umpqua River through up to Hina Head, um, which is up north, north of uh, north of Slabs. So, it was a fairly large reservation, and all the coastal people were to live in that reservation because the uh, Plains Reservation, moving them over those mountains, had failed. It wasn't any longer a, a viable option. So people were moved to out to LC sub agency. And they lived there. Um, the plan was <laughs> to uh, uh, federal government, great plan, uh, to raise wheat, corn, uh, potatoes, potatoes worked um, on the Yahats Prairie. Um, you guys probably have small gardens somewhat at home. Uh, it's fairly difficult to raise wheat and corn <laughs> on the Oregon coast um, in a peat bog. <laughs> uh, so that failed, and uh, it's estimated between 15 and 60 percent of the people just died from starvation, and disease, malnourishment. Because the treaty was never signed, the treaty, there was no monies to pay for any of these people. Um, that's why the treaty needed to be ratified, uh, in order to legally purchase the lands, in order to fund the people moving there. So the people were moved, but there was just no funding for food, for housing, for anything, for schools, for mills, all these things were problems, and none of them happened. Um, eventually, the people were allowed to move out of the initial uh, Yahats Flats, and they started going upriver, up in Yahats, and were able to raise enough to start feeding the people. But by that point, the people were much smaller numbers. I'm helping myself with the dates. Not a, a public speaker. Uh, so in 1975, people decided that they wanted to close down the reservation. Um, because at first, those lands weren't very popular because it was all about farmlands. But once timber started becoming thing, a really important thing and a trade item, uh, and also oysters, Pacific oysters that were still alive at that time. Um, not the Pacific oyster we have today, but a smaller uh, type of oyster. Um, those lands become, became more sought after. So uh, they decided they wanted to close the reservation. And they held meetings there with all the headmen because somebody, some awesome person in Congress, actually, I've never said that before, but, uh, <laughs> put in a clause that they had to get uh, every headman's approval 
in order to close the reservation. And there were 19 headmen still alive at that time, including the Alsea. Uh, now the Alsea is pretty much uh, extinct. There's a little bit of it, not a whole lot of this left. Uh, left. But, um, so there's Alsea, Sayusla, Lorompa, and Kus, people living on that small reservation of Yahats, um, are, are part of the reservation. And so they held a meeting, and not one of the people in that meeting gave permission for the reservation to be closed. Um, they had already been moved. They didn't want to move again. Um, and I have the minutes from that meeting, and I just want to read a couple quotes from a couple of Sayyid Islam people that spoke at that meeting. These are uh, translated, and they're insightful, frustrating, depressing. <laughs> but. I do not know you, Mr. Fairchild. Fairchild is the person that came from the East to talk to the, to try to convince them to move again. I know Mr. Litchfield. Litchfield is the Indian agent at the time of the Alsi Summit. I will give you my mind. You understand our language. I will not talk much. Ever since you have been here, I have talked to you. I have always wanted you to send my words to Washington. I do not want to hear any more about this thing. A long time I have heard it. I thought it was all settled long ago. As long as I live, sorry. <laughs> um. <coughs> These are my relations. So I'm sorry. Um. As long as I live on my land, I'm not sorry I have nothing. My people have all the same mind as I have on this point. <clears throat> I don't want to help the chief in Washington get our land, President. I understand the Washington chief wants to send us money. What for? I know the mind of my people. They do not want money. It is long since we had money, and we no longer care for it. I have only a little place and no money. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yet my heart is not sick. The great chief sends money to the Indians, but does not understand their hearts. At first, the whites promised many things that people will never do again as they once did to sell their land. If I was to talk many days, I should say the same thing. It was not my wish to come here at first, but the great chief desired it. This thing I will not give up. General Joel Palmer, <coughs> gave us this country, and I will never give it up. That is all. I had two more of that, two more. <laughs> um, I'll read one for my young person here. Because <clears throat> the other two are elders, chief at the time. This is a, a lesser headman. Uh, his name is Saisla George. The other one, uh, Saisla Dick and uh, Saisla John. They had to take Christian names just so you know why their names are that. Uh, I do not want to put myself ahead of the old people here, but I will talk a little. What makes the whites think our people know better than dogs? Let them talk as much as they please. How can the whites believe in a just God and try and drive the Indians off their land? It would be well if they would make our country better by helping us here. Long ago, when I was a boy, I heard this driving Indians. That is the way they did, and now the Indians are nearly gone. <clears throat> my father died on my land. Well for us to die there. For our children, <sighs> sorry. <laughs> I'll get back to history in a second, I'll be fine. <laughs> If our children grow up, it will be good for them to take our country and be buried there. There are few of us, and we do not want to go to another country to die. Because at the time, um, many uh, each river basically was a country. Um, there were uh, all kinds of different uh, languages on each river. Uh, Saishwan spoke our language. Uh, Lorompa was 
same language as one nation. You go up north to the next nation, up to the Ao Si people, then that's a different country. You, you see that as a different country. So, uh, all of these people said no, basically, and nobody signed the agreement. Um, but uh, Mr. Um, what was his name? Fairchild took back the message to Congress that they all agreed. And so the Yelhawks Council came to a close, and in 1876, the people were kicked off the reservation. And the reservation was closed. In some cases, people came uh, from Corvallis and literally pulled people out of their houses that they had built and sent them on their way. Um, so at this point, treaties still not signed. So nobody received any payments for these lands, um, and they were never sold. Uh, legally. So the people just, people live where people live, right? Good, good village site is a good village site. So most of the sites that they went to move back to were divided up by fences for agriculture. And so when they went back, uh, many of the lands were taken and a lot of people settled on the North Fork of the site as well. A lot of people settled on the South Slough down in Coos Bay, lands that weren't really wanted at the time. Um, and in 1878, uh, has anybody ever heard of the Earth Lodge cult? It was a, I'm sure you've heard of the ghost dance. Yeah, so people have heard of the ghost dance. Well, on the North Fork, where the uh, substation is today, you know where the substation is on the North Fork probably, there used to be a, a plank house there and that was the Earth Lodge cult. It was a ghost dance that moved in. And uh, people were desperate at this point. They were, they were willing to take on anything. And, and so uh, the Earth Lodge cult became known um, around there. People would dance and dance. And the ghost dance is all about dancing to bring back the memory of your ancestors. Um, it was illegal at the time uh, to dance, but people would meet there and dance anyway. Um, because I'm not sure if people actually feared it, but that's kind of why it was illegal, because people um, feared the dancing. They feared that they would uh, rise up because of the dancing, because they had seen it happen uh, east. So the Hoo Hoo Lodge, and it was 24 by 64 feet, and it was in that spot. In 1887, the Allotment Act was passed, and the Allotment Act some of you are probably familiar with that, um, or most of you or all of you, I don't know. But uh, the Allotment Act was uh, put in place, and that gave lands to tribal people that applied for them. And they were tax-free lands under the Allotment Act. Um, but as the people got allotments, not all of them were tax-free, and then uh, the government would try to collect taxes and end up taking a lot of allotments. Some allotments, though, did remain uh, tax-free, and one of them you're probably fairly familiar with because it's where Three Roos Casino is today. That was an allotment land by the Hatch family, and uh, the tribe purchased it um, in the uh, late 90s, I think. But so that is an allotment, and that was actually a, uh, a spot where dances were performed on those dunes, um, where sites saw people pre-contact dance. Um, in 1911, a lot of people saw that the tribes were basically being decimated, um, and the tribes kind of got together. This is kind of the beginning of the confederation, uh, as we call it, the confederate tribes of Kusama and Saves Indians. And uh, so anthropologists started visiting and recording language on wax cylinders, um, and that's where we, where any language I know, a little bit from my great grandma, but most of the language I know came from those wax cylinders, came from hours of just making my ears bleed listening to those things. Um, and they were recorded into the what's known as the Laurent Quat text. And if you're interested, go online and Google Laurent Quat text, and you can review the texts in Berkeley that are written down. Um, are really cool, uh, really good uh, information there. 
1916, Chief Bobby Burns died, and that was kind of a changing moment for the tribes, and that is when we uh, formed uh, uh, the government as we know it today um, by the tribe. And actually, there's a election happening right now down in Coos Bay. Um, so we do elections, we elect our officials, they run on three-year terms. Um, so that's when that kind of started in 1916. In 1919 is when the Confederate tribes as a nation sued the federal government. So they sued the federal government for unrightful land uh, possession, right? Because the treaty still, had, and to this day, the treaty has never been ratified. Um, so 11 years passed, and eventually it was um, uh, said the Supreme Court ruled over as being hearsay. So everybody had a stake in the Court of Claims case. So they said uh, no, basically. Um, other tribes learned from that and were actually able to uh, hire anthropologists, hire uh, experts, people that just weren't tribal people, and go on behalf of them and speak, um, saying the same thing and getting plans back, getting payments. <laughs> uh, it's just, at the time, uh, it wasn't uh, good to be a Native person, uh, especially when you're talking before the government. In 1924, the, um, the Citizenship Act took place, which is really good, sort of. Uh, the good part is that people became a citizen of their own country, people that became uh, able to vote. So my great-grandmother got the opportunity to vote for elections. Um, and it also, um, the bad part is it kind of, it took a lot of rights away that were formerly there, like hunting and fishing rights and things like that. Um, in 1938 is when officially the Court of Claims case fell through and the United States government said that, that uh, it's hearsay, you don't have that land, uh, you weren't here. Even though uh, later documents revealed it in four minutes that we were 1941, has anybody been to the tribal, wall, tribal hall in Coos Bay? No? Well, yeah, so, so in 1941, the CCC, through the BIA, built our tribal hall. And that tribal hall was to be used for tribal people of that area. Not just the Confederate tribes, Coos, Long, 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 but also for well people, sleds people, uh, all kinds of different tribal people that are in the area are uh, supposed to be able to use that building. And, uh, it had a big meeting room, had a kitchen, which was used for game processing, uh, had a clinic in it that a doctor once a month would come and visit and see what ailments people had, um, had a lot of different things. And that's actually where my office is, down at Coos Bay, it's in that building, it's on the National Historic Roll, so it's pretty cool. And that is where people started working on uh, restoration because in 1954, I think, in 1954, what came through was the Termination Act. The Termination Act, basically, the government uh, <laughs> relatives uh, received a letter that just said they just weren't tribal. Um, the government was ceding all agreements, basically, that they had had former with the tribes. So, tribes were terminated. Um, this didn't happen to all tribes, but many, most of the Oregon tribes happened to it. I think it didn't happen to Warm Springs, but other than that, it pretty much happened to everybody, all the coastal tribes at least. So that happened in 1954. The bad part, termination. The good part is <laughs> uh, it repealed the ban on marriages between Indians and non-Indians, and it also stopped issuing cards of individual Indians. And we could buy wine and beer, yeah! Because <laughs> before that it was illegal for Native people to buy wine and beer, because it made us buy it. Um, my uh, great-grandpa in 1956 went to the United Nations, he appealed to the United Nations um, to uh, 
trying to get them to step in on the behalf of the Native tribes and stop the Termination Act. Um, it didn't work uh, because at the time, the United Nations didn't actually recognize uh, Native Americans as nations. Um, now they do, actually, as of 2000-something. Um, but at the time, they didn't. So they said it was an internal issue. The United States needed to take care of it. And people worked and worked and worked lots of flights to Washington with funding just from whatever they could gather up. Um, and then anybody, do people know when the tribe was restored? When the compared tribes were restored? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1984. So finally in 1984, I was two years old. Yay. I was born pre-restoration. Um, in 1984, the tribes were restored. And um, many things happened before that that um, the tribes worked to do. We had a tribal trading post in tribal hall for years. We sold uh, groceries to low-income families. Um, we also, in 1976, uh, worked with James Thornton of the Coos County IED to promote one of the first Indian education programs in the state. But in 1984, we were officially restored and became a government. And since then, basically, um, we've just been working for self-sustenance. Uh, we've created a museum down in Coos Bay, uh, and we get to have a government where, um, in 2001, uh, the Culture Committee built uh, our plank house, and so we have a plank house down in Coos Bay um, that we use for ceremony and dance. And we also have a sweat lodge down there that we use for sweats. Um, and I know I had five minutes a couple You're minutes fine. ago, so I'm going to do a real quick, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's a pop quiz <laughs> <laughs> that goes with this. So this is a native IQ test. And uh, I use that loosely, very loosely. But uh, it covers uh, some generic knowledge from around the United States, well, the continent of America, I should say, and also some uh, knowledge that is really local here. So here we go. And it's multiple choice. I'll read them all, and you can raise your hand. The Holocaust of World War II was not only one of the most tragic events of the 20th century, but of modern history in general. Close to six million Jews, nearly two-thirds of all, Amer uh, all European Jews, and many other people perished by comparison. Approximately how many Indians in the Americas died within a century of Christopher Columbus's arrival due to unnatural deaths? And A is nearly five million, roughly half the existing population. B, nearly 10 million, roughly half the existing population. C, nearly 10 million, roughly 95% of the existing population. Or D, nearly 100 million, roughly 95% of the existing population. And this is the Americas. So think about that. Right now. Last one, yeah. 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 Nearly 100 million, roughly 95% of the existing population. Um, archaeologists now are really finding a lot of different things that you know, cities that are just were completely full upon arrival, right? Especially in the Mississippi, is down there at that area, and down in New Mexico, there's there was huge cities with running water and you know, a lot of technology that you know, savages can't have. But, uh, which of the following statements did Christopher Columbus make to Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain when writing about the native peoples of the Americas? A. They would make fine servants, but 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. B, we could send from here in the name of the Holy Trinity all the slaves in Brazil would, which could be sold. One Indian is worth three, and word. Uh, C, both of the above, or D, none of the above. C, C both of the above, yeah. Uh, the practice of scalping dates back to ancient Greece, was introduced in Americas by the Dutch, is where the term Redskins originally came from. D, all of the above. D, it's all of the above. So a lot of people don't realize that the term Redskin um, comes from, uh, there used to be bounties on scalps of Indians. And so uh, the Redskins, uh, people were offended by calling them scalps, so they called them Redskins. They would trade otter pelts, beaver pelts, and Redskins. And the skins were red because, well, obviously on the underneath, because the front
fresher the red skin, the better. And uh, it wasn't, it was not only adults, this was practiced on, but also the children. 12 and under was a lower price than 12 and up. Uh, here's one from us. So when the, was the first recorded contact between members of our tribe and Euro-Americans? 1826, Laurent and Indians met Alexander R. McLeod, a trapper working for Hudson Bay Company, who visited the Anqua Estuary, who stayed in Cocoa Rivers. 1792, Laurent Quah Indians encountered Robert Gray and his crew on the Columbia Red Aviva, and they paddled their seagoing canoe out to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, see, 1840, the Laurent Quah Indians listened to Methodist missionaries sing hymns and preach on the shores of the Pacific, but escaped a mission from one of the preachers. Reverend Gustavus Hines concluded the doom of extinction was extended over this wretched race. Or D, 1640, two Indians met Spanish explorers coming up from, at the time, Spanish territory, exploring the South Slough region for gold. E. B. B. 1792, yeah. So that was the first one we were talking about. How does the U.S. Declaration of Independence refer to American Indians? A. As merciless Indian savages. B, as the native inhabitants of the land. C, it does not mention the existence of American Indians. D, none of these. C. 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 It's actually um, A, as merciless Canadian savages. So the correct answer, uh, more fully, the Declaration of Independence refers to Native Americans as the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and Six, in its policy of removal, the U.S. government forced American Indians to leave their ancestral lands, for example, in a march that began in 1838 and was later called the Trail of Tears. 17,000 Cherokees were moved west under conditions so severe that 4,000 people died. Were our tribes removed? If so, what year and to where? Yes, in 1856, the Coos people were forced to move from Coos Bay to live as refugees on the Umpqua North Spit among the Lower Umpqua people of that region. Uh, B, no, our tribe never moved because our lands were never legally purchased according to the Organic Act of 1848. C, yes, in 1859, the federal government removed the Coos, Lohanqua people, to Yahats Prairie, or D, A, and C. D, A, and C. Yeah, A, and C. You guys are good. <laughs> uh, when did the U.S. declare that Native Americans were U.S. citizens? Uh, 1855, when we signed our treaty. 1954, when we were terminated. 1924, with the Indian Citizenship Act. 1984, with our restoration. Cool. Yeah, 1924. And that's when the federal government uh, passed the law. It takes a while for states sometimes, so it was a little after that. So that's it. That's the quiz. Like I said, it's Ruth's fault. I saw that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no sense. Uh, and uh, I really, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, you know, talk about this. I know it's not like, the most comfortable subject sometimes, and uh, but uh, I think history is important, and your guys' is seven, uh, whatever you call it, uh, uh, to live by. Um, these these kind of things are what happen when you don't practice, and um, so I think those kind of things are very.